Good morning. We're the Heinzes. I'm Annie Hines. I'm Jada. And I am Isaiah Daniels. And welcome to worship this Pentecost Sunday at First Presbyterian Church here in Newcastle, Pennsylvania. We warmly welcome all of you joining us today in this very special celebration of the Holy Spirit's descent into the world, into humanity, and into all of creation. We live freely and fully because of the love that God has for all of creation. John 3.17 reminds us, this is how much God loves the world. God gave us Jesus the Christ, God's one and only Son. And this is why, so that no one need be destroyed. By believing in Christ, anyone can have a whole and a lasting life. We at First Presbyterian strive to live this truth. And we invite you to join us in a worship that proclaims and teaches this truth. That out of love, God does all things freely and justly and calls us to the same truth. You can access our bulletin from our website or simply read the words for the songs and prayers visible on the screen during the service. Online giving can be done to support the ministries, missions, and programs of First Presby. You can access our safe giving portal available on our website homepage as well as find our contact information, what we believe in, who we are, and what we do. This week, we want to wish a very happy 93rd birthday to Mike Ramsey and happy birthday to Drew Show. The First Presby Church family encourages you to discover love and discover God as we continue to live as his light in the city. May God bless you this Pentecost Sunday and always come let us worship God.
Good morning, friends, and welcome to worship this morning here at First Presbyterian Church. I and the congregation welcome all of you worshiping with us today. Today is Pentecost Sunday. It is the day that we celebrate the dramatic pouring out of God's Holy Spirit upon the early disciples of Christ who have gone out into the world and proclaimed the good news and given to us the legacy that we have today. And so in that power, in that glory of God, in that wonderful, sweet, sweet spirit, I invite all of you to worship with us this day. And I invite you now to join together in our opening prayer of blessing. Loving God, loving spirit, holy one, you are the source of all unity, all attraction, all bonding, all intimacy, and communion flows from your Holy Spirit. Each of these relationships is sacred to you. Your presence is liberty. Grant us this freedom as we worship God the three in one this day. Empower us not to fear treading in unknown ways, nor to be held back by misgivings of ourselves, of each other, most importantly of you. Bless this day to praise you in your grace, peace, love, and light. In the loving name of Christ Jesus our Lord, Amen. Join your voices, your spirits together as we open with our song of praise, Holy Spirit.
My brothers and sisters, we believe that coming together in the one mind of God in the body of Jesus Christ to confess our sins is a freedom that we experience because we come to the place of mercy and full forgiveness, compassion, and understanding when we come into the presence of God humbly and open and willing to be ourselves before God and one another. And so I invite you into this moment, this humble moment, to join together in our prayer of humility. Loving and holy God, beckon us forward to the place of your loving and merciful will, which is the place of your loving forgiveness. Beneath our accumulation of sin, the wonderful future face of humanity, which is slowly emerging in the splendor of the risen Christ, cries out to you for our healing, the healing of our pessimism, our selfish prejudices, our unjust and oppressive behaviors that result in the anguish of our spirits. Allow your mercy, forgiveness, and love to release us of our guilt and our shame so that we might develop a vision of purity, lives generous in love and simple in heart and in action, rooted deeply within the realities of you, our loving God. Hear us now as we silently confess our sins to you. In the name of the living Christ, we ask this. Amen. Friends, the truth is that God, God the Holy and Eternal Spirit, inspires all fruitfulness and creativity, the signs of true bonding and intimacy with God and with one another. From the Spirit comes the great urge to heal what is broken, to reunite what is separated, and to recreate the face of the earth, of all of humanity. And friends, this is the good news of the gospel, that in Jesus, the living and ascended Christ, who has sent his Holy Spirit into our hearts as our advocate, and in him, our sins are fully forgiven and our lives are made new. Amen. Our message today comes from the second book of Acts, verses 1 through 21. And this book, uh, for those of you who may be unfamiliar with it, is the story of the early disciples who followed Jesus and the Apostle Paul. And the ways that they went out into the world to witness and proclaim what they had experienced in the presence and in the teaching of Jesus Christ and in the revelation and in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so this narrative, this story that we hear today is the dramatic telling of this moment when this power came upon them and how it transformed them for the rest of their time on earth. 
So as we prepare to hear our own um, hearts and minds to hear this word, as we prepare ourselves to hear this word, again, I would invite you into the reality and the power of Jesus Christ that is here in this time and in this place. And my friends, truly desires that we understand and um, acknowledge this power that is within us, this kingdom of God, to be transformed by it, and then to take it out into our own lives and to do something with it, allow God to do something with it for good. Join with me, will you please? Loving God, we thank you. We praise you for your living word that has spoken through the ages that speaks to us even now, that has the power to transform us, our thinking, our beliefs, our faith about ourselves, about you, about all of creation, about one another. In these moments, may your Holy Spirit come upon us, renew our faith within you, refresh our beings, our souls in your presence. And we thank you for the grace that is imparted to us, for the mercy that we are given, for the love that you bathe us in, for the light and the wisdom and the intelligence that is yours, given freely to us to guide us in our lives. And we thank you for this guidance, for this living word. In Christ's name, we thank you. Amen. When the Feast of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Without warning, there was a sound like a strong wind, gale force. No one could tell where it came from. It filled the whole building. Then, like a wildfire, the Holy Spirit spread through their ranks, and they started speaking in a number of different languages, and the Spirit prompted them. There were many Jews staying in Jerusalem just then, devout pilgrims from all over the world. And when they heard the sound, they came on the run. And then when they heard one after another, their own mother tongues being spoken, they were thunderstruck. They couldn't for the life of them figure out what was going on and kept saying, aren't these Galileans How come we're hearing them talk in our various mother tongues? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, visitors from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, immigrants from Rome, both Jews and proselytes even Cretans and Arabs. They're speaking our languages, describing God's mighty works. Their heads were spinning. They couldn't make head or tail of any of it. They talked back and forth, confused. What is going on here? Others joked, they're drunk on cheap wine. And that's when Peter stood up and backed by the other 11, spoke out with bold urgency. Fellow Jews, all of you who are visiting Jerusalem, listen carefully and get this story straight. These people aren't drunk, as some of you suspect. They haven't had time to get drunk. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. This is what the prophet Joel announced would happen. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on every kind of people. Your sons will prophesy, also your daughters. Your young men will see visions, your old men dream dreams. When the time comes, I'll pour out my spirit on those who serve me, men and women both, and they'll prophesy. I'll set wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billowing smoke, the sun turning black and the moon blood red before the day of the Lord arrives, the day tremendous and marvelous. 
and whoever calls out for help to me, God, will be saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And I apologize earlier. I think we just had some trouble uh, with the mic. You might have heard some feedback there. I'm now on this microphone here at the pulpit, so hopefully we won't have any more problems. We're grateful for our tech person, Marty, who was able to come right down here and kind of save the day. <laughs> the great blessings that we have. You know, my friends, a lot of people think that the Bible is just for Christians, and uh, let me reassure you, especially if you have never turned a page in it, or have wondered what it is, or wondered why it's important, it is a book for humanity, is what it is. And that's one of the things that the scriptural story, this narrative is sharing with us today. God is for all of humanity. And so we happen to believe as Christians that the Bible is the word of God. That's what we preach, it's what we teach. And what we mean when we say that is that there is a truth within it that could not have come from humanity, but comes from this eternal, divine, invisible presence that permeates all of creation. And that that presence from the beginning has been in love with what it has created, and that includes us. And so the scripture, the Bible, is the human story. It covers every struggle that humans have. Even though it was written in a particular time, we still recognize it. We still have the same struggles. They're just cleaned up a little bit better. They're just a little more civilized, and, and in many cases, they're more covert. Humans are still marvelous and wonderful and generous and peaceful, and they're also still cruel and sinful and hateful and, and prejudiced and violent. We are all of those things, both and. And so the biblical text, that story, is about our existence and our struggle. And in the midst of that, at every turn, how divine love, what we recognize as God and God's power, within us and with all of creation, works to break through the experience, to speak to it, to do something dramatic, to transform it so that we are empowered to be changed for good. Oftentimes we have suffered consequences in that that have been painful. And that's where this text has us today. This is a group of people who has suffered great pain and oppression in where they live under a Roman rule. They're a minority, they have no power. But they have followed Jesus Christ for three years and he is no longer physically present to them. And so in some translations of the Bible, a person might read that this group of people were together in an upper room and they were there praying and one mind because they were fearful for their lives. We can recognize that. Who hasn't been fearful when someone they have loved has died? Someone they have depended on, who has guided them, who has been there for them? We get that. They have had their lives changed in dramatic ways. Now that physical presence isn't there, and they're wondering, what do we do? Do we have any hope? Do we have any future? What next? And then we have this dramatic telling of a scene of a power coming upon them. It reminds me of a, a, a scene out of an Indiana Jones movie, if you've ever seen those movies. It's very dramatic. And that telling this drama is supposed to um, give us a sense of how transformative these moments were for these men. And I believe there were women there too. The disciples of Jesus included women. They were transformed by a particular spirit, we're told, that sounded like a 
gust and a gale of wind. Now, I have lived down on the Outer Banks, lived through a, several hurricanes, and I know that our friends are down there worshiping with us today. And you know what that sound is like. It sounds as though the whole roof is coming off of the, the building, that gust. And it shakes a person to their core. And then all at once, there's this manifestation of the invisible presence of divine love that is fire. Now think about that. These folks already felt like their entire world around them was falling down. Now they feel as though the building around them is coming down. And then all at once, there is this great fire that appears, and they're able to see it. And you know, I really believe it's because they were at a point in their lives where they were completely open to it. They were vulnerable, they were humble, and they knew they had no other alternative but to turn to God. We often do that as a last resort. Well, I'll pray. Maybe there's an answer in that. And that's usually when we're open enough to accept whatever God is bringing to us. What I find poignant in this story is how this, this presence of divine love that comes upon these frightened people manifests itself with this visible fire, passion, that is really kind of cleansing too as well, gets rid of what isn't necessary and makes it very clear to them what their next action can be. And they begin to speak in the tongues of people around them and think about this. Two things are very important. One, how much God loves variety. <laughs> Three things, really. How much God loves variety. How much God values the variety of creation. And, and wants creation to know God. And thirdly, how we cannot be in relationship with other people and share anything about God or God's spirit if we don't speak their language. We cannot assume that we can press upon another person the truth of God if we don't understand the language. And that's a beautiful part of this story today to learn how to speak the language. It calls us into the foundational truth about creation. It's about a loving relationship. And when we desire to have a loving relationship with this, it's a just relationship, a peaceful relationship, a righteous relationship, then we desire to learn the language so that we can communicate on the most intimate of levels. It's exactly what God is doing in these moments. From the very beginning, creation has been set on this foundation. It's relational, it's loving, it is God's will within this world. That's the transformational power that we're given as human beings. It doesn't just specifically belong to Christians, it belongs to all of humanity. But Christians who say that they believe this are called more than any other to proclaim this good news and to live it out. And we hear what the key to this is at the end of this scripture today. Whoever calls out for help to me, God will be saved. And this is really the key to a transformational life in the Holy Spirit. How much do we truly go to God to want to be in one mind with God and in one person and in one spirit to find out what God's will is for our lives? How much do we really want to do that? How much are we open to that? And if we begin to understand the scripture as being for all of humanity, it means that God understands what makes us happy and gives us joy and gives us peace and heals us and sets us on fire in righteous anger. 
or what depresses us or what causes us grief. It's not like any of this is a big mystery to God. But how much do we trust that power to understand us and our struggle, our anxiety, our worry, our fear? If we don't do it, we can't expect to hear much. We can't expect to be transformed much. And this story tells us how simple it is. Go to the God who loves you in the situation where you are at the moment and connect with that one mind and say, here's the situation, help me. Want to know how simple this is? I had a great friend years ago who, who bought a house, moved into a house, and the house had been redone. But in the backyard there was a shed, and the shed hadn't been open probably for about a year. But um, my friend didn't really think about that when she went outside to um, put the lawnmower in the, in the shed and you know move in. She was moving in. When she opened the doors to the shed, she heard this great rip and this thunder. Didn't know what it was. And then something, she said, made her look up to the corner of the door, and there was one of the biggest nests of wasps she had ever seen in her life. She was face to face with it. And she said, in that fear of that moment, she became very quiet and she heard unarticulated words within her mind say to her, move slowly and pick up the wood that's at your leg. And for some reason, she did it. And then it guided her to turn around and to run. And she did it. And she heard that thunderous hum behind her. And then something said, stand still and put the board up to your face. And as she did that, she cried out with the loudest voice that she had, Lord Jesus Christ in heaven, help me. And she meant it. And she put that board up at her face and didn't close her eyes and watched all of that thundering hive of insect come at her, go around her. And when she stopped hearing the humming, she turned her head and looked up in the tree and there was the entire hive of, of insects that had formed itself around this invisible hive, didn't exist. If you've ever seen them come out of a, a hive, that's what they do. And she stood there in wonder, not one sting, nothing. And she fell down on her knees and I'll tell you what, that was her conversion to believing that any time she was in trouble, if she allowed herself to be open to Christ, he would help her. And here's the thing, she didn't have an agenda. She didn't demand, don't let me get stung. She just did what she heard. She listened and she did it. She listened and she did it. And she was vulnerable enough at that moment when she saw that wasp nest come apart that in many ways it probably saved her life now there may be some of you out there who could say to me you know I have prayed this thing in another and it hasn't changed my life no I, I wasn't saved I've been there when I prayed for certain things and it hasn't come a certain way I have thought it should but when I look back on those moments, and I'm honest with myself, I always had an agenda behind that. Please, God, do this thing according to my will, not thy will be done. And you know, friends, it's when we are open, as open as a window, as a book, as a soul or a person can be at the moment, and to just say, I know you have lived this life and you have this answer better than me. 
that we are able to accept what God has to say to us and we are able to do it with grace and with confidence. We should not forget that these disciples who had this moment with the Holy Spirit were people who were in fear of their lives. And it wasn't as though everything was all rosy after this. In fact, they had more challenges than they ever had before. And most of them were martyred. But they lived their lives in a confidence of God's power and peace that they always knew was there for them, guiding them, loving them, and ready to meet them when they died in this world and came into the presence of God. And my brothers and sisters, I'll tell you what, if you haven't grasped that for yourselves, you're not living. Because the life that we have comes from the power of God within the person of Jesus Christ. And he promised that his spirit would come upon us would renew us, fill us with the wisdom, guide us with the intelligence of God for our well-being and good, because God so loved the world and truly wants us healed, released from our sin, freed from patterns of injustice and prejudice and rage, free to live as disciples in the kingdom of God. And if that hasn't been your experience yet, then I encourage you to turn to God in the place that you are right now. Begin to speak to God as though God were as close as your breath. To find a Bible, you can even pull it up online on Bible Gateway, to begin to read it and to find your human experience in that book and able to be transformed by the power of God's loving spirit in the presence in the person of Jesus Christ who resides in the authority in the right hand of God, our loving parent. In Christ's name, I bless you and I thank you for joining with us today. Alleluia and amen. Uh, my brothers and sisters, as we met a meditate upon what we may have heard in God's word to us today and in God's Holy Spirit speaking to us. I would invite you now to join together your spirits, your voices in the hymn of grace, the sweet, sweet spirit.
My brothers and sisters, join with me as we affirm our faith. We believe that God, by God's Holy Spirit, baptizes us with the flame of faith, filling us with a breath of zeal, inspiring us with a witness of martyrs and saints that sends us out into the world to live the life of the living Christ in power and in compassion, both now and until the end of the age. Amen. My brothers and sisters, I'd like to take a moment to thank all of you who continue to support, to support the um, ministry, the mission, and the uh, programs here at First Presbyterian Church from our past into this present time and into our future. We thank those of you who have been worshiping with us online, who live, um, some of you, states away who have sent in your generous donation. We thank you so much for that. And um, and for those of you who faithfully give in your income, in your time, um, in your energy, in your ideas, and in your volunteerism, we thank especially our folks who have been faithful throughout this quarantine. You see our worship team behind us. We are our organist, Don Rogers. We have Madeline and Lydia Ubery who have faithfully um, been here to guide us in worship. We thank Lisa Rogers, who takes care of the wonderful slides, and we thank Marty Bartello, who has been our tech person. And we thank the people who have been cleaning this church, Gary and Stephen, who have just been outstanding, and Janice, who has been faithful in the office, all the leaders of First Presbyterian Church in the congregation, and most especially those of you who have prayed along with us in this time. And so as we dedicate all of this to God this morning, my brothers and sisters, we do so believing that God is able to take all of these gifts, these talents, these people called to serve God in the world and to use them. And we thank you, Lord, for your wisdom, your intelligence, your spirit that continues to guide us this day. We offer to you these gifts this morning. We trust the fact that those who use them will be filled with your intelligence your wisdom be guided by your sense of compassion and justice so that these gifts will always be used for the good of people, the good of the world, and the good of the church. We dedicate all of this to you today, and we thank you for it. In Christ's name. And as we lift before you, dear God, our prayers in this time. We trust that you will draw us into one mind to be one mind with you and one spirit. For you are true and only light from who comes every good gift. We ask that your spirit will come into our lives with the power of a mighty wind. We ask that you will open the horizons of our minds by the flame of your wisdom, that you will loosen our tongues to sing your praise, for only in your Holy Spirit can we tell of your glory and acclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. Loving God, we ask to live this day in joy and in praise, but also to live before you the suffering of this world and the grief and what we have lost during this quarantine and what we are grateful for and what we have gained and learned for the sorrow the grief of death and sickness and for our country in the way that it suffers today for those who feel that they have no voice, for those who don't know you or believe that your power can make a difference and change people. For this is the mission 
in the ministry of the church that you have founded. May we learn and believe how to give every service that proclaims your love the power and the authority it deserves. We thank you for the people and the relationships that sustain us and we ask that your spirit will be close to those who are grieving the loss of these things. We ask for your wisdom and your intelligence in our calling to daily discipleship that we may understand what that means, that it means thy will be done, not our will be done. And yet, as we come into a deeper relationship with you, we find that we want nothing less than your will. It becomes our will. May we be grateful for the signs of new life and hope in this world, even now with a great suffering, to not just rest upon the successes of the past, but we be willing each time to hold the bar higher, to reach higher, to expect you to take us further, to do more. We ask your intercession and your power for the stewardship and the healing of creation, for the healing of humanity, for our friends and our family members, our congregations, for our neighbors in special need, for the wisdom of the Holy Spirit for this day. May we recognize poverty in our midst and ask you where our resources can best be used to relieve suffering. May we empower rather than enable and ask you and never be afraid to ask you what next, Lord, what would you have me, us do next? You are God, you are our creator, as in the beginning you formed us out of the dust of the earth and you breathed us into life. And so now by your Holy Spirit, breathe into us new life. As at Pentecost, your spirit fell upon waning disciples and empowered them as your faithful witnesses Now, by your Spirit, fill us with joy and boldness. May the power of your Spirit transform us. The prompting of your Spirit lead us, and the gifts of your Spirit mark our lives, our behavior, our words, our thoughts, our actions, both now and forevermore. And we believe, Lord, that as we lift all of this to you today, that you do take it into yourself and by the power of your Holy Spirit, that life is truly transformed so that we might rest assured that in the end, that all shall be made well. All shall be made well, all manner of life within the living Lord Jesus Christ, that all shall be made well. And we believe that you hear us now in the prayer that Jesus has given to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. My brothers and sisters, as we prepare to carry God's light out into the world and that spirit, that sweet, sweet spirit, into the world. I would invite you once again to close our service today with your spirit, with your voices. Come, O Spirit, dwell among us.
living God within you. You are called to take this God out into the world and to never be afraid. For it is the living Jesus Christ who strides out before you. He goes ahead of you. He prepares a place for you. He waits there for you. And when you lose your way, I guarantee you, he will turn back on that road to meet you. And I bless you now in the name of our living God who loves you more than you could ever imagine. And Jesus Christ, who is the living revelation of this life, this truth, and this way, and the power of the living Holy Spirit that binds you to God and to all of creation. Hallelujah, hallelujah, and amen.